Um, I'm just trying to get the video on um, while trying to do that. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Limpopo Civil Society and Community Engagement um, Consultation Webinar. Um, I'm I'm Kela Kanongo no kwa sukura na munda roba tanga ne zaka bega na mshumu ya na musi le amche tuwa isu. We are going to start with the webinar. Um, we are just sorting a small challenge, um, but if you can hear me, I'll in the meantime start, still be running, taking you through the the program for the day, um, as well as talking to uh, the speakers, the expert speakers for the day. We, you will all be back and, and be unmuted. We just having a small technical challenge. Um, so let's just set the ground rules as we start. Um, one of the things we will expect from you is that you switch off your video, <clears throat> except for the speakers, and as well mute your mic when you are not talking. Um, so that we can have a quality background to the webinar, as we are also recording the webinar. Um, so we are just having the challenge because most of the people cannot talk back. So we are trying to resolve that as we are going on. So if everyone can hear me, let me talk quickly through the program for the day. So this is a two hour webinar and the purpose of the webinar is actually to dive in into the non-communicable diseases as we are presented with the challenge of um, COVID-19 and we cannot do this face to face. We are left with doing this kind of engagements and workshops through webinars. The good advantage is that now we are learning the new normal and the use of technology. So the program for today, I'm going to do the welcome. And after that, we're going to have the opening remarks uh, by Mr. Russell Rensbeck. Um, then also we're going to have our three speakers. That is Dr. Mariana Koza. That's our first speaker followed by questions. After that, we are going to have um, Ms. Makoma Vopape talking about our relationship with food. Then also that will be followed by comments and questions. And our last speaker is going to be Dr. Yandisa Mangashe. I, I have been trained, she has been training me the whole week to actually spell her name correctly. So yeah, I hope I got it right. And we're going to have a good 25 to 30 minutes discussion on our question and answer session, where we'll allow you know, all the delegates to actually ask any question from the speaker. Um, after that will be followed by the way forward and what are some of the next steps in this work um, by uh, Comrade Russell again. Uh, from there we'll close the webinar. Can everyone hear me? Just wanna check that, that I'm not talking to myself. I can hear you, Lawrence. Okay, perfect. So I'm not sure if everyone is able to speak back. Yandisa can speak. Makoma, can you speak? Morning, Lawrence. Morning, yes. So <laughs> it seems as if all our speakers are able. Russ, are you able to speak? Yes, I am able to speak. Can you? Okay. Thank, so it thank looks you, like all, all our key speakers will be able to speak. So what I will propose is that when, while we are still sorting out the video, um, we can we can actually start um, with the session. Um, and I hope all the delegates can 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 hear me. It's not only the speakers who can hear me. And I will check that with the group. Um, that we have with the with the comrades in Limpopo. Just let me know, comrades, on the group if you can hear me.
I'm just checking with everyone if they can hear clearly so that we don't assume that everyone is sorted. Yes, I am. Okay. Yes, everyone can hear us. So I propose that we start, right? The video technology will find us on the way. Okay, great. So I will, I will give this time to Comrade Russell to actually make sure that he opens the session for us. Let me start by welcoming people, everyone. We have civil society organization in Limpopo who have kindly joined us and we've worked together to organize this webinar. This webinar is co-hosted by Healthy Living Alliance and Rural Health Advocacy Project. Um, with us here, we have the Treatment Action Campaign delegates. We have delegates from National Association um, of People Living with HIV and AIDS, NAPWA. We have Positive Women Network. We have Positive Action Campaign. We also have um, Section 27. So what we are going to do, I will allow Russ to do an introduction of RAP and HILA, just giving a brief overview and what and the remarks about the purpose for today. Unfortunately for now, Russ, we cannot activate the video yet. There seems to be some technical issues, but I do feel let's start with the program since everyone can hear everyone. Um, so Russell Ransbeck is the, is the director at Rural Health Advocacy Project. So I will hand over to you, Comrade Russ. Good morning, everybody, and, and comrades from Limpopo who have kindly joined us, and thank you for the opportunity for this opening address. Um, look, the last couple of weeks or months have been really challenging for all of us South Africans. You know, I think recently we started hearing more about the impact of non-action on non-communicable diseases and what it's doing, not just to overall mortality with diabetes now being the second leading cause of death after TB in South Africa. You know, but now also with COVID, we found out that people living with diabetes and untreated diabetes particularly are at increased risk, almost up to 13 times if they should contract COVID. Now, this is really, really problematic. Because currently in South Africa, there are over 4 million people living with diabetes, but our treatment coverage is only 30%. So only a third of all people living with diabetes are currently on treatment. And those are the ones that know that they are living with diabetes. So as, but diabetes and deaths around diabetes is absolutely preventable if people access treatment or implement measures that prevent the onset of diabetes, like watching the kind of things that we eat, be by getting tested and being aware of what the criteria for testing is, and also making sure that our living environments are such that we are able to respond in a way. So I think this consultation and collaboration between um, rural, the Rural Health Advocacy Project, which as you know, is, is a project that advocates for equitable access to quality healthcare for rural communities, and the Healthy Living Alliance, which looks to put um, non-communicable diseases, particularly diet-related non-communicable diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and so forth, into the public spotlight, an opportunity to start talking about a greater health system response and the role of us as organizations to work with our communities in advocating for a more considered response to diabetes and other diet-related non-communicable diseases. And some of the things that we hope to look at is look at the relationship between food and health and what's in our food and how our diet transition is contributing to greater burdens of disease, as well as some of the measures that we can implement at the local level to ensure that we can actually start addressing this pandemic in much the same way as we did in the, in the 2000s, where we are now, where we have over more, more than 4 million people on HIV treatment, which in 2002 seemed like an impossible task. But our work is not done, and I'm hoping that 
with this consultation and further consultations forward, we can start working together to expanding our advocacy to deal with much, much more of the health problems that we experience at a local level. Now, I'd like to, 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 to end there and wish you all well over the, the, the course of this presentation. And please, let's keep these engagements open so that we can continue to talk about it. Dr. Koza will be introduced by Lawrence, and I'm sure she'll give us more of a, a public health insight into exactly what this pandemic is about or epidemic in, in the case of non-communicable diseases. But I, I really believe that it's time that all of us become a little bit more educated around what are the risks out there and what are the kind of things that we should be working together to ensure that the broader public is aware of some of the measures that they can take and the government can implement the kind of regulations that protects us from future pandemics like COVID. Right now, we've been exposed. Our lack of response to non-communicable diseases and the government's lack of response to it has really put us at risk. And over the next 6, 12, 24 months, depending on who you speak to, we are in at increased risk, and now is the time for us to act on this. Thank you very much for your time. Over to you, Lawrence. Thanks so much, Comrade Russ. This is really appreciated. Um, just still also checking is can ev if everyone can hear us. We do have the chat box. Um, if you look on your webinar, you will see participants, you will see chat, you know, record. If you have any issue, you can chat on the, um, on the chat tab to just let us know what issues you could be having. Um, another thing is, if you have any issues also, we have the WhatsApp group for the leaders of civil society in Limpopo. So if you have any issue that you want us to resolve, you can actually chat with us on that group. We seems to be in the full fledge. I'm excited and I'm really looking forward to um, further engagement on this session. Um, I'm the son of the soil by birth, actually not even politically, born in Limpopo. So I'm really excited and we're hoping and looking forward to having this conversation. And comrades, please engage, please ask questions, please um, express yourself. And just maybe to put a note that we will use English as a medium of instruction, but this should not prohibit everyone, anyone from expressing themselves in their mother tongue and translations will be provided. Anyone who can express in English is fine, but we don't want a language to be, uh, to prohibit people from participating. Let me take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker. That is Dr. Mariana Koza. She is a first year public health um, medicine registrar at the Department of Community Health. She graduated as a medical doctor in 2015 and completed an internship in KZN. In 2018, she moved back to Johannesburg to complete a community service. Her special interests are public health care, mother and child health, and HIV and AIDS. Dr. Goza holds two postgraduate diploma from College of Medicine, South Africa, one in child health and the other one in HIV management. Dr. Koza, the floor is yours. Um, you can take us through your presentation. Talk to us. Dr. Koza, you are on mute. So please unmute first. I can hear you are talking, but you are still on mute. You are still on mute. So unmute the mic. There we go. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? There we go. Wonderful. All right. So I'll be giving the public health perspective 
on um, non-communicable diseases in the country and COVID-19. So just to kick us off, I'd like for everyone to have a look at this picture and um, just think about if anything is concerning you about it, um, give it a thought. We will be coming back to just discuss this picture at the end of the presentation, but have it at the back of your mind as I'm going through the presentation. I will be covering COVID-19. I'll be giving a small little outline, um, timeline and we'll walk down memory lane in terms of South Africa. We'll speak about non-communicable diseases. We'll define them. We'll talk about the burden of these diseases in South Africa, what the common risk factors are for them and where we can actually intervene. So just to kick us off, um, Coronavirus has been with us for only about five to six months. It feels like it has been forever, but actually um, it was in December where in Wuhan, China, we found out that there was this weird pneumonia that was going around and WHO then announced on the 7th of January that there's a new strain of coronavirus that is going around. Initially, it was thought that the strain was um, transmitted from animals to humans, but later um, it was confirmed that it, in fact, it is human to human transmission. And the numbers were just going rapidly up and it was all over the news. It was all over social media and we were all worried about it. And <clears throat> by the 11th of March, the WHO had declared the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic. Pandemic really meaning that the virus had spread from that small town in China to other countries in the world and that everybody now had to take precautions against it. So on the 5th of March, and this is where the South African story starts, we then first had our first case, which was an Italian gentleman Oh, sorry, an, a gentleman had traveled to Italy. There was actually nine of them, and I think they were called the Italian Nine, and they were our first few cases. At this point, we were thinking that um, the virus was really mostly restricted to people who had a travel history, but within 10 days, just because of how contagious the virus is, um, there was reason to worry that we had actually community spread and the president declared a national state of disaster. Um, if any of you have children, you'll know that your children are probably excited because on the 18th of March, schools were closed. Um, I'm sure the kids were not aware that or were not, um, were, were not ready for how long schools would be closed for. Um, but you know, with the increasing numbers, the president then decided that a national lockdown um, should um, take place to ensure social distancing and to ensure that we flatten the curve. So the understanding here is that we do understand that, that at some point up to 60% of the country will be infected by this virus. But what we don't want is we don't want everybody being infected by the virus at the same time because our health system will just not cope. We will just not have enough beds for everybody who's infected if we all get the virus at the same time. And these, these were the reasons why all those restrictions were implemented. So on the 20th, 27th of March, we then had our first death of coronavirus in South Africa. And where are we now? Well, the deaths have shot up. We are now at more than 2,000 deaths. This is from the SA Coronavirus um, website. And this was on Tuesday, but um, I think the deaths today are above 2,200. So really the numbers have increased rapidly. I've highlighted here the Western Cape, which is um, the epicenter of the pandemic in our country. They have more than half of the total cases that we see in the country, and they also have majority of the deaths. Um, for Limpopo, what we're seeing is that you have, at the moment, um, quite low numbers. You've had five deaths. Um, I think the latest numbers show that in terms of the number of confirmed cases, you now have 730 from 622 on Tuesday. So that shows that the numbers are really rapidly increasing. And I just want to also highlight that um, as much as you may be having lower numbers, you don't want to be complacent. We don't want to be seeing the numbers that Western Cape is seeing, especially in provinces that are um, that have less resources like Limpopo. And we're already seeing this phenomenon happening in the Eastern Cape where they're having a lot of cases, but they have less cases than um, Gauteng, but have almost double the deaths um, that Gauteng has. And this is because they just do not have the same resources as Gauteng. And this speaks to the inequities that we have in our country. So who is dying from COVID-19? And, you know, studies have been done now and we have a global picture um, as to 
who is highest at risk of dying from this virus. Um, so studies are showing that males, especially males over 50 years old, are more likely to die of the virus than females. But in fact, really anybody who's over the age of 50 is more vulnerable um, to the virus. This is the big one. People with chronic comorbid conditions, people with um, comorbidities, especially um, lifestyle related diseases, your non-communicable diseases. And I've listed um, the top four um, on a global picture that have, <clears throat> that have been um, associated with um, increased risk. Diabetes, number one right? High blood pressure as well. Chronic respiratory conditions. So this is people who already have damage to their lungs because of either asthma or smoking, as well as coronary heart disease. So um, that, that's what we're seeing on a global picture. But we have been having quite a few deaths in South Africa. So um, there's a preliminary study that's being done now currently in Cape Town, and it's starting to show us the South African picture. And um, so before the virus came to the country, we were really worried because we have such a high prevalence of HIV and TB in the country. So we were worried about that population and we were scared that it would impact that population the most. But what we are seeing is we're seeing quite a similar picture to um, what's happening globally, which is that people with lifestyle diseases, again, diabetes, are the ones who are at highest risk of um, dying from this um, coronavirus. So men, again, are more 40% more likely to die of COVID-19 than women. 50% of the deaths, of that more than 1,500 deaths that we've seen in Cape Town, 50% of them have been in people who have diabetes. Mostly people have uncontrolled diabetes, um, but the study um, authors do still state that just having diabetes still puts people at a higher risk of dying from coronavirus um, if they get it. High blood pressure, 19% of the deaths that are happening in Cape Town are a result of high blood pressure. Interestingly enough, um, we were worried about um, our HIV population, but we're seeing that um, only 12% of the deaths have been in people infected with HIV. The authors of, authors of the study also state, though, that um, this particular HIV population that has died from coronavirus um, are people who've been living for a long time with HIV. There are people who are on ARVs, and because they've been living for a long time, they've actually developed lifestyle diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. So they mentioned as um, the HIV group, but in fact, they also have underlying illnesses that have made them um, very vulnerable to the virus. Chronic kidney disease, diseases, apologies there for the, um, the missing word, which is, it's meant to say 9% have been dying from chronic kidney disease, and then 2% um, from active TB. So the TB and HIV population hasn't as far as we've seen, has not been as affected as what we were expecting. Again, it is the people with lifestyle diseases. What causes deaths in our country? Um, you know, outside of this coronavirus picture, what are people dying from? And um, you may have heard of a term called the quadruple burden of disease. Quadruple meaning four. And basically what that means is that um, there's these top four main causes of deaths in our country. These are not in order of which one um, is killing people the most, but these are, this is what we're struggling with in South Africa. So HIV, AIDS, and TB. HIV, not so much anymore with the introduction of ARVs, um, but it is still um, a problem, definitely much more than in other countries. Non-communicable diseases, and I have that highlighted. And non-communicable diseases, um, as you can see on the slide, are the leading cause, cause of death, not just here in South Africa, but globally as well. These lifestyle related diseases. So each time, whenever I say non-communicable diseases, what should be popping in your, in your mind is lifestyle related, um, because these are diseases that are really as a result of what we're eating, whether we're exercising and the habits um, that we have um, or are partaking in such as smoking and drinking. Um, high maternal and child mortality is still a problem in the country and high levels of violence and injuries. And really, if you look at these four causes, these are very preventable deaths. So we're having premature deaths in the country that are preventable. So just looking at um, non-communicable diseases, and this is a definition that I got from the South African Health Review, which says that Non-communicable diseases are basically by their nature, slowly progressive medical conditions um, that are 
very long duration. So they're chronic and they're slowly progressive. They're non-infectious. So these are not diseases that one person can give to the next. If you have diabetes, you cannot give it to somebody else, unlike um, coronavirus and HIV, where you can transmit um, the virus to somebody else. Um, particularly these diseases demand long-term care. And this is why we want to highlight them. Um, because when people um, get complications from these diseases, it can result in significant disabilities. People can um, lose function, so they're not able to go about their usual daily activities, such as simple things like um, bathing themselves and so on. So they can be a serious burden um, to their immediate family, a serious burden to the communities, and a serious burden to um, society at large and to the health system. So the STATS SA um, figure that I have on the slide is showing that non-communicable diseases have been on the rise. Again, every time I say non-communicable disease, you must be thinking lifestyle related diseases. They are, um, they are responsible for up to 57.4%, 57.4%. I like to round off. So this looks like 60% of deaths that we are having in this country are a result of lifestyle related diseases. And you can see if you follow the pattern of the blue line, which is the infectious diseases, um, you see that the diseases are actually, the infectious diseases have dropped with the introduction of ARVs, um, you know, HIV and, um, HIV has not been as big of an issue as what it was in the early 2000s when people did not have um, ARVs. So just keep that in, in mind that we have 60, almost 60% almost of, of deaths in this country are related to things like diabetes. And just like um, Raz said when he, he opened, diabetes has moved from the fifth position in 2015 and is now in the second position of um, the cause of most deaths. And you can see even in Limpopo, and this is also from Stats SA, showing that even in Limpopo, even in um, communities, these are not just lifestyle diseases of people who are rich. These are lifestyle diseases that we are seeing across the board. Um, cerebrovascular disease is also third there and hypertensive disorders. 36% of these diseases are happening to people um, before the age of 60. And we really need to just pause there for a second and think about it. 36% of these um, very preventable lifestyle diseases are happening in people who are, you know, before the age of 60. These are people who are supposed to be contributing to our economy. These are people having dependents, being children, or much older people um, who are depending on them. And these are the people who are supposed to be growing our country. Um, in terms of the risk factors for non-communicable diseases, we speak about modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So the non-modifiable risk factors are the risk factors that we can't really do much about. So these are the, you were born this way type of risk factors. So your age, we can't really change it, your sex and your genetics, but these contribute very minimally to um, actually getting these non-communicable diseases. Um, in fact, the modifiable risk factors are said to contribute um, the most um, to people and to people when they end up having diabetes or hypertension. And um, right there at the top, underline highlights unhealthy diets. So what we are eating, um, you know, is contributing to um, us getting these diseases. Um, tobacco use, alcohol use, physical inactivity, those are the top risk factors. And these are really affected by where we're staying. They're affected our be by you know, the behavior. Um, they're affected by the behavior in the community, the societal um, determinants in the community and structural, the economy and so on. I mean, you know, to a certain extent, we all like to think that we have choice, but our choice is impacted by when you go to the grocery store, what is there that you can buy, you know? And so in public health, we speak about these um, four levels of prevention. We speak about um, primordial um, prevention. And this is where you want to target the whole population before they even interact with risk factors. And this happens at a social and economic po um, policy level. And if you can think of, well, if I could um, give you an example, it would be, for instance, where if we wanted young school children to know that they shouldn't be smoking and so on, before they even um, start being 
exposed to cigarettes and so on and things like that and we go to grade ones and we go across the whole country and we start teaching little grade ones about smoking and the impacts of that and so that is some sort of primordial prevention and then at a primary prevention this is when um you having a population that is interacting with the risk factors, but you want to you want to make it difficult for them. So you want to make it difficult for people to be able to smoke. So you want to make it difficult for them to access cigarettes. You want their cigarettes to be quite expensive. Um, and this can also be with, um, for example, with food. You want people to um, not buy very um, sugary drinks. So you um, impose some sort of fiscal tax, which the other speakers will speak on, um, to make sugary drinks much more expensive in a way to kind of deter people from buying those drinks. At a secondary, secondary prevention, this is when the person has been drinking these sugary drinks and they basically are obese and they have some sort of, they're in a pre-diabetic stage, as Russ said, and um, they're having high blood sugars, but they're in the community and they're still living their life and they're okay and they're unaware that they are now having this disease. So. Um, what we would be doing at a secondary prevention is that we'd be going out into the community or we'd be trying to find these people while they're still in that pre-diabetic asymptomatic stage and we try and get them to um, change their lifestyle and we'd want to put them on treatment early before they have any complications. And um, one of the, the, the final um, levels of prevention is in tertiary prevention. And this is when the person has now has the disease, is symptomatic and present with complications. And um, we try and pre prevent further complications. So this might be somebody who is now diabetic and um, we try and prevent them from being blind by making sure that we, they're on the right treatment or they may be blind and we now have to give them re rehabilitation. So this is um, a very late stage to intervene and we don't really want to intervene there. We want to intervene at the primordial level. We want to keep people healthy and we want to keep them at their optimum health levels. So um, this is the Ottawa Charter of Health Promotion, which really is, um, it was introduced by the WHO in 1986. And it speaks about if you're looking at a health issue, you should not just look at it, um, just look at one facet of how you can, um, you know, intervene for that health issue, but you should look, kind of have a holistic picture. And it speaks about looking at these five levels um, of where you can intervene. Strengthening community action. So if we want to be telling people about how their diet is impacting their health, we need to be using the community structures that are already there, the churches, the societies, um, use the community radios, you know, to get the messages out there, developing personal skills. We want to educate people about, again, let's focus on food. We want to make sure that people, when they go to the grocery store, they're aware of those little marketing gimmicks that make them buy the food that is unhealthy for them. So then we also put policies in place where, for instance, with just a sticker on, um, you know, uh, on a bottle or something, they can know whether that, um, whether that food or what, whatever they're buying is good for them or not, depending on, for instance, we can color code it. If it's red, they know, oh, this is something that might be dangerous for my health. If it's green, oh, this is something that's healthy. So you empower people so that even when they're making choices at an individual level, they're able to make healthy choices. Creating supportive environments is one of my favorite ones. And basically what it means is that we need to make the healthy choice um, the easy choice, you know? It's no good saying to people, you need to be eating healthy, you need to be, um, you, you, you shouldn't be drinking sugary beverages, but when they go to their local supermarkets and when they go to the shops, um, the only thing that is available are sugary beverages. We have to create environments where they have other options. You know, we have to make sure that the environments are healthy environments. Um, Reorientating health services, this is really, really important. And in um, South Africa, we are speaking about um, primary health care, strengthening our primary health care system, making sure that we're taking health care to the patient, not waiting for people to come when they're at that tertiary level where they now have complications from these diseases. We want to find them while they're still healthy and we want to keep them healthy. We want to educate them. And the best way really to do this is by having community health care workers who will go into the communities and into the households of people where they can talk to people while they're still healthy, but also they can um, 
you know, be able to find people before, while they're still asymptomatic, but maybe have the disease, they can then, you know, do by just doing simple things like blood pressures in the households and seeing that, oh, no, you have a high blood pressure, you must go to the clinic. We should not wait for patients to feel that they are sick, um, you know, for them to then come to the hospital. And then that's when we intervene because it is then too late. And these patients, again, are a huge burden on the economy, they're a huge burden on families. Building healthy public policy, this means that really uh, um, all of public policy, whether it's the Minister of Transport is making up a new policy or the Minister of Finance, we must have health at the center of whatever policy they're making. So if the Minister of Transport wants to build new roads, they need to be thinking, how can I make these roads um, contribute to making up a healthier population. So have cycling lanes, bicycle lanes where people can ride bicycles to work and things like that. Um, and our other speakers will actually be speaking about the fiscal taxes and how those are an example of healthy, um, healthy public policies. So just to go back to COVID-19 and the impact on patients with NCDs, Russell spoke about this in the beginning. And I think it covered it quite well. So basically people with non-communicable diseases are suffering because they, most, the, they are the most vulnerable to dying from coronavirus. Coronavirus, for somebody who is healthy, can just be a simple flu, it can just cause a bit of snuffles, um, nothing too serious. But for somebody with um, diabetes, it can really be um, the straw that breaks the camel's back. It can possibly be a death sentence, you know, so they have that issue. But also there's the other one where because of the regulations and the restrictions, there's been disruption of access to medicines. There's been disruption of um, health services, meaning that um, because again, we're not using our community healthcare workers the way that we should, we don't have enough of them to start off with. And our primary healthcare system is so weak um, that majority of our um, patients who have these diseases are still very dependent on health facilities and hospitals. And they need to be getting into, excuse me, they need to be getting into taxis to um, get to these hospitals. So when we um, brought down these regulations and restrictions, it's meant that we um, caused a barrier for them to get to their chronic medication. And because of poor communication and not having proper resources that they can go to to find out, you know what, my high blood pressure medication has finished. What should I do? People didn't know what to do and they were getting information from friends saying, no, don't go anywhere, etc. So they were then, we're having a lot of um, these people sitting at home with very high blood pressures, with their sugars sh shooting up and possibly having um, complications. Um, so, you know, moving forward, what can we do to try and really um, change the trajectory of where we see the country going with these lifestyle, very preventable premature deaths? Um, and at the core of it, I really think it's making the patient the sense of the health system take health care to where the patient is. Let's not wait for patients to come to us at the hospitals or um, in health facilities. We need to be going to, patient, to people while they're actually still um, healthy and we need to be intervening there and we need to be giving them the knowledge and empowering them on how they can promote their own health. Using patients, so patients who already have the disease, use them as ambassadors. So especially for NGOs, look for these patients, let them be the ones to tell their stories and let them be the ones to say, I got diabetes and this is how I got it and this is the food that I was eating because people learn from each other and the other really important thing is understanding the cultural backgrounds and linking that to health policy so the government is a way that um South Africans are dying from very preventable um, deaths of these non-communicable diseases. And they've put in quite a lot of policies, but we need to start asking questions is are these acceptable to the end user? Do these um are these acceptable to the end user and do these um are they, are they, do they somehow translate to the end user for instance in Limbopo um, there's a high usage of tobacco but not in people don't necessarily smoke it especially in the villages um, there are women who um, use snafe so when we have policies and we say don't smoke you know, are we reaching those people that are using tobacco products, but they are just not smoking them? And how do we then make policies that speak to um, those people? Using already existing resources, um, such as families, community partners, NGOs, and um, schools. So I'm out of time, but I just want to 
emphasize that I think Limpopo as a province has the opportunity to lead the fight against NCDs. Yes, we have a weak primary health care system. Um, yes, it doesn't have that many resources, but it does have a growing economy. Um, there's new knowledge um, that is coming into the province and it should be the right knowledge. So don't look at Kauteng and look at Western Cape and say, oh, they have, um, they have so many McDonald's and they have all these Burger Kings and there's all this globalization that's happening as well. But, and say that you want to start bringing those economies into um, Limpopo. If it's, if it's going to be threatening um, the health of the population in your province. You should then start um, thinking about how you can create your own economy, have your own malls that have their own um, takeaway um, restaurants, but are healthy restaurants. Um, the Limpopo has great community programs, such as the Gokko so soccer teams, which are really great. Um, they, it's quite popular and you need to be strengthening these type of programs. Have the Gokos play against their grandchildren. Have um, young ladies who, you know, are amongst the people with the highest levels of obesity also participating in these programs. Supporting local produce. There's no reason why anybody should be living next to a farm that has vegetables, why they should be paying much higher prices. So it's again, advocating for the fact that um, people are living in spaces of farms and so on, eating healthy should be again, an easy choice for them. It should be a cheap choice. Geographical spatial planning, and I touched on this by saying that with the new suburbs that are coming up and um, with the new maybe cities that will be coming up in the provinces, in the province, we should be talking about how we can um, make them green cities, have cycling lanes, um, so that we protect and promote people's health and we don't wait for people to be diseased before we intervene. So do we still remember this image? Um, I'm just wondering if anybody has, apologies for the typing error there, um, has thought of what may be concerning about it and maybe we can discuss it and I'll also give my views. Um, at the end. Thanks, Lawrence. I'm done. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Dr. Koza, for the powerful presentation. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the presentation. Let me allow the delegates, the participants, to ask the questions related to NCDs and COVID-19. I'll give it five minutes. You are welcome to make chats on the group, um, you also can. I wanted to check if we have the icon to raise a hand. Um, if you find that icon, you can raise the hand so that I can identify the person who is actually, who wants to ask a question. Yes, there is. If you go to the chat, you see panelists and attendees, and then you can actually raise a hand um, in order to for me to identify you. Um, so in terms of the questions, this is how I want to actually discriminate first. I want to first give an opportunity to the Limpopo civil society and community reps to ask questions. And then if there are questions within um, our partners, thereafter I can check those questions. And please don't forget at the end of the, before the end of the session, we'll have enough time to ask questions. So I'm opening the floor for the questions coming from the delegates. Um, so members of Treatment Action Campaign, NAPWAM, um, Positive Women's Network, um, Section 27, um, as, well, as well as Positive Action Campaign to ask questions. And then if there are questions from our partners and colleagues, then I can take those questions after. You can chat your question. You can also raise your hand up. I see a question, a hand up from Tavo Mulelekwa. I haven't got seen any hand up from the delegate. So I will take the question from um, Tabum Leleko. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think uh, Dr. Kosa mentioned this, but I'm not sure if I um, uh, 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 so, cause um, I just need to understand in the presentation, 
uh, it shows that uh, uh, there's only 2% of people uh, uh, with TB who have died from, from COVID-19. Now, here is my question. I'm, I'm very concerned about uh, diabetes. Um, the, 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 the experts, um, <clears throat> I, and also, as we know, uh, they are saying <clears throat> people with um, the uh, illnesses that are affecting the lungs are more at risk of uh, uh, dying from, 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 from COVID-19. But now, how is it possible that uh, we have a, a higher number on diabetes than on TB? Because on my uh, mind, um, I thought we will have uh, people who like will have a larger percentage from uh, people who have uh, uh, lung diseases like your TB, um, anything that has to affect the lungs. But now, how is it possible that uh, we have a larger number on diabetes than on TB? Thanks. All right. Lawrence, can I answer? Yes, please go ahead. Doc. All right. Thanks, Tabo, for the question. Um, so I think uh, one of the main things to think about, especially with any disease really, is that the way that our bodies are made is that we have natural defense mechanisms against disease, and this is your immune system, right? So even for... Um, even for a disease like TB, you have um, what we call soldiers. You have an immune system that fights against these diseases. So with diabetes, what happens is that because of the effect that these high blood sugar, this very high blood sugar um, has on the cells in the body, it affects the immune system, right? So then the soldiers themselves are not able to fight not only things like coronavirus, but many other diseases. So people with diabetes just have like a global attack on their defense system. Um, and this is why I would think we're seeing um, more deaths in um, people with diabetes because of the effect that the diabetes has on their immune system. Whereas if somebody just has TB, their actual immune system might be fine and their immune system just has to fight the TB. Whereas with diabetes, it's the defense, it's the immune system that is already down. And I'm not sure if I've clarified that answer um, nicely for you, but especially now with the um, studies that are happening, it's going to also clarify a bit more as to why we're seeing these um, deaths happening more in people with um, chronic um, diseases like diabetes. But again, it is because of the effect that these chronic diseases have on the immune system, globally on the immune system. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, great question, Tabo, and um, the comment. There is a one question, um, Doc, on the chat, um, and it goes like, we all know that you can you can take med medication. Let me start with the one from Daniel Matevula from TAC. According to the presentation, you mentioned the policies to, to like uh, alcohol abuse, tobacco, et cetera. Does, does this mean that the you the use of alcohol and tobacco contribute towards COVID-19 and non-communicable diseases. All right. Um, so the use of um, alcohol and the use of tobacco contributes to, there are risk factors for developing non-communicable diseases. And um, they contribute again to um, if you're using tobacco, they contribute to damaging the lungs. If you're drinking alcohol, that can cause liver damage, which can also then affect the um, immune system. But again, it, these contribute to you getting these chronic diseases. And the connection that we're seeing between COVID-19 and non-communicable diseases is the fact that if you have these non-communicable diseases, if you get COVID-19, which um, I was trying to emphasize in the presentation, COVID-19 and a healthy person um, who doesn't have these communicable diseases can just be a simple flu. They may not even know that they have it, but in somebody who has a non-communicable disease such as diabetes, if they get COVID-19, they can die from it. Um, so that is the connection. So not necessarily that alcohol itself will make you um, 
get COVID-19, but rather that um, the use of alcohol and its effects on your body and your system makes you at risk of getting non-communicable diseases. And if you have them, it makes you at risk of getting complications from those diseases. And it makes you at risk of dying from viruses that are supposed to just cause a simple flu, you end up dying from it. I hope that also um, answers that question well. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you so much, uh, Doc. There is a question that I, there are a few questions that I'm picking up from the chat. There is one from Amkelan Gonyama. We all know that you can't take medication with an empty stomach. In our communities who have poor of the poorest, during this lockdown period, they are unable to get any food as they do not have any source of income. My question is how can we help those? I will propose that we, we take this question into the discussion that we're going to have uh, on the last 30 minutes, if you all allow me to. So I'm um, Kelani, uh, we're not ignoring your question. We're gonna have a thorough discussion around food system, you know, um, and food security later on on the session. Um, so if you allow me, Doc, I would like us to pack that one, uh, but just note it and, and process it in the meantime. There is also a question, um, From, I think it's a question or comment from Vicky, Dr. Vicky from NCD Alliance. NCD met not on CCMDD. Government only has uh, one, 1 1.2 million out of 3 million communicable clients. Equity now, no equity. Um, I think it's, that's more of a comment. And if you allow me, I will want us to take all these comments and process them so that when we go to our next session at towards the end of the session then you can have comments on on, on those questions and comments that came up so thank you very much uh doc dr Koza, for such a powerful presentation um i still want to welcome the participants to ask questions if you are on youtube channel and you feel you you are you can't find the chat box please ensure that you send your question either through WhatsApp so that we can get the, your question to the panelists. And to my panelists, please look out on your private inbox so that I can help you advocate and manage time. So when you are presenting, we'll kind of like be giving you guide in terms of the time, how you are doing on the time um, so that we can keep all our presentation on time. Thank you very much, Doc. And, um, I want to applaud you for the lovely presentation. Let's go to the second presenter. Who is Ms. Makoma Bopabe? Ms. Makoma Kingwanawa Limpopo, she's a daughter of Limpopo. Um, she's a lecturer at the University of Limpopo, the Department of Human Nutrition and, and Dietetics. She is a dietitian by profession and has passion in infant and child nutrition. She also has um, interest in obesity prevention. She's a registered uh, postgraduate student at the University of Western Cape, UWC, and is actually engaged in the obesity, in the local obesity prevention project that HILA and REP is part of. Ms. Popape, if you can hear me, please activate your video and unmute your mic and the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Lawrence, and good morning to everybody. Okay, as mentioned, my name is Makoma. Um, I stay in Polukwani in Limpopo province and welcome everybody to the Garden of Eden. I wish I could send you some avocados, but unfortunately it's not possible because of the distance. So the topic that I've been asked to address today is the relationship between diet and health. 
I was actually thinking this morning, reflecting on how much money I spend on food, because I was thinking uh, diet and health. And the question that I wanted to ask you, you don't have to respond, is how much money to spend on food per month? And what is it that we buy every month? And what effect does the food that we buy have on our health? So as, as, a, as a way of introducing my pick, I want us to reflect on two questions, which are not coming up now. Um, so the first question that I want to ask as I'm still grappling with technology is, um, in your opinion, do you think diet, and when I say diet, um, I'm not referring to what we use to lose weight, I'm just referring to the food that we eat. Do you think there's any relationship between what we eat and our body weight? There we go. Um, can we reflect a little bit what we eat and, and our body weight? Is there any relationship? Or is how I look dependent on who my parents are or what I'm supposed to weigh, I will weigh irrespective of what I eat. So this is a question that I'm posing to all of us. And if we can have two people um, respond to, to this question before we move to the next one, if there's really any relationship between food and disease. So I'd like to start with the first one, Lawrence. Um, if it's possible to open up um, for, yeah. So yeah, so the question is, is there any relationship between what we eat and our body weight? Great. So the floor is yours. I'm trying to check if there's anyone whose hand is up. If you are unable to activate the hand up, you can actually just go for it and mute your mic. Um, let's please allow people to unmute their mics and, and actually make comments to the question. Okay, um, from my side, I think there is um, a, a relationship between a, a weight and, and, and the food to, uh, that we eat. Reason being, I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, the, the, the previous speaker showed us um, a picture of uh, uh, someone eating a burger and all that. We know that uh, in those kinds of food, uh, there's the, 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 there's too much oil, and uh, the food itself is uh, I think um, is not healthy for for our bodies. So when we consume it, uh, I think I'm not sure what happens in our bodies. Well, I, I'm not a doctor, but this is what I think. I will just put it that maybe the fat then um, build up like in our bodies, and then um whatever that happens on the inside it then comes on the outside i will uh, start gaining weight pin peak pin peak pin peak and then yeah that's what i'm thinking that there, there's really a relationship between what we put in our food and uh, what we put in our bodies and and our weight thank you tavo uh, which reminds me of the saying you are what you eat Thank you. Um, and there's also a response. If you eat unhealthy food, um, like maguinha and chips and sweets, you're gonna gain weight. Perfect. Um, so, so then it means I, I will not be giving a lecture. I'll just be reminding ourselves of the relationship between food and weight. So as a way of discussing my topic, um, so this is the presentation outline. Uh, sorry about that. I'm going to be talking about diet on weight and health status, what causes overweight, obesity, and NCDs, like it was covered in the previous uh, presentation, which is non communicable diseases. All the time when I say NCDs, please just know I'm talking about non communicable diseases. What are the consequences of overweight and obesity? And then I will summarize. So, before I even go on, why, why do we eat? If, if food 
is such a culprit in increasing body weight and causing non-communicable diseases, why do we eat? So just the question, just one person, if uh, one person could just talk to us, why do we eat? Last night, when we all went to bed, we thought about what we'll be eating the next day. What are we eating for lunch? Uh, when we woke up in the morning, we all had something to eat. So the question that I'm asking all of us is, why do we eat? Anybody, just one person. You can just unmute and speak if you can't find the, the tab where you need to raise your hand so that we move. Seems as if there's no comment up to this far, Makoma. Um, okay, this one we eat because we need energy. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to talk to you right now if I wasn't if I didn't have my breakfast. So, so these are the two main reasons that I thought we should talk about. Why do we people? Why do people eat? The first one I thought it's for social interaction. Let's look at it. Um, what I have noticed is. Food brings people together. If there's a gathering and you'll hear people saying, will there be food? If there's no food, people will just say, no, I'll pass. Why bother calling us if there's no food? So one of the big things about eating is it creates that bonding. Um, it creates that social togetherness. I don't know, it looks like when we're eating, there is this um, happy juice, this happy juices that just flows from everybody. That is why when you read health books, uh, we are always advised to eat together as families because it is a great way to distress at the end of the day. It is a great way to uh, chat with our kids. It is a great way uh, to strengthen family uh, bonds. So one of the things that food brings to all of us, it makes us happy. Think of the times where you share food with people, how you feel at the end of the day. You feel relaxed, you feel happier, you feel uh, more satisfied. So that is one benefit of eating together. But of course, the greatest one is we want to provide our bodies with nourishment. Um, look at those kids, if you want happy, healthy, um, energetic, intelligent children, research has shown that nutrition plays a very big role in that. And not just giving them any food, uh, we give them food that nourishes. Look at what they have there. They have fruit, um, they have bread for energy, they have fruit for prevention of diseases. Remember, we always say that um, eat fruit for prevention of diseases, um, eat bread for energy. It eggs for proteins. So th those are some of the primary reasons why we eat. And the other one that I have there is we eat to restore good health. I was just thinking um, if a person is sick, one of the things that we ask is, um, are they eating? Because we realize how important nutrition is. And when you talk about eating, especially when a person is sick, we don't think of things like uh, Simba chips. We don't think about things like Maguinia. When you go to the hospital, we take them fruit, we take them um, uh, milk. Sometimes we take them food that is nutritious because we know how nourishing the body is. And the biggest one is prevention of diseases. It does not matter which type. Um, it looks like at the moment, the, the diabetes is on top of the list. So one of the things that food does at a very primary level is prevention of diabetes. When you talk fruit, when you talk vegetables, when you talk milk, when you talk nuts, those are very simple food, but they play a very big role in preventing diabetes. And also when a person is diabetic, they, they play, they play play a very important role in controlling diabetes. And as um, Dr. Kosa was saying just now, one of the things that kills a diabetic patient is 
uh, when their condition is uncontrolled. And we all know that uncontrolled diabetes, one of the important things is the food that they put into their mouth. So it's a combination of medication and diet, but diet plays even a bigger role. Hence, we are having this conversation today. So in the next slide, uh, this is where now I want us to talk about the relationship between diet and obesity. So at a very simplistic level, we have an equation. I'm saying simplistic because a lot of things come into play, but the bottom line is if a person eats too much energy and they don't use up the energy, which a lot of us don't, because most of the time we're sitting in the office um, or we are in the households as we are now and not doing a lot of work, we end up with too much uh, body weight. And how do you know that a person has too much body weight? Uh, look at my people there. Um, it's unisex, it's not female, it's not males. Um, according to the, no, forget about that. So if we look at the pictures, there's the one at my far left, uh, forget about that one. There is the second one, which is a little bit blue. This is where health experts say most of us should be. It's uh, the body mass index, which is between 18.5 and 24.9. Don't worry too much about the numbers. But I just want to share with us, that's where um, experts recommend that we be at. Because as soon as we move to the person, the yellow person, look at them, they're looking a little bit rounded, which means now they're starting to put uh, too much fat on their skeleton. And when we are at that point, that is where the risk for NCDs begin. Um, and unfortunately, culturally, if you come to my place, when I start looking like that, then people start commenting me and they say, you, now we know who the woman of the house is. But unfortunately, that kind of praise now comes with um, a, the risk for non-communicable diseases. Uh, because culturally, we believe if a person is thin, then it means that person is not happy. But unfortunately, happiness in how I look and happiness in terms of how my body interprets things like uh, the risk for non-communicable disease is completely different. So as we are now in the era of talking non-communicable diseases, our role as health um, activists is to try and encourage people to move from the yellow person and move towards that uh, blue person. I think it's blue and I hope it is blue. Um, and unfortunately, once people start losing weight, what do we say? Then we say, hey, what is happening to you? And we, we now create this atmosphere where people start feeling it is wrong to lose weight. So as health activists, our role is to go out advocate for healthy body, uh, body weight without any stigmatization. Um, and the other way of knowing whether a person has put up too much weight is when the size of the waist circumference, the waist circumference is increasing. Um, I always make a joke that if you find that now you are starting to shift yeah. the, the button mm -hmm. on your belt, get worried because then it means you are getting too big. Um, look at my skeleton there. There is some yellowish substance next to the, to, the, to the bones. And a lot of people, when they start gaining weight there, they say, hi, Jualiki Jachelet. And unfortunately, that is not money there. Money is in the bank. What is there is body fat. And research has shown that the fat that accumulates in the belly is the worst of because that is the one that increases the chances of non-communicable diseases. So ladies, if we find that we are starting to adjust our uh, skirts, then we know we are at a high risk of non-communicable diseases. And just to, to share some statistics, uh, in 2016, Statistics, statistics South Africa found that in Limpopo province, seven out of 10 women were for either overweight and obese, and that's a big number. Um, and I was, and I, as I was reflecting, I was thinking, is it because we eat twice before we start eating? Like when we are cooking, 
Then we have that pirinki where we taste meat and then we put a little bit of pap. And once we are done with vegetables, we also taste that with pap before we can actually sit down. So these are the kind of things that we should start teaching and advocating, um, especially amongst women. Um, because one of the things that I have noticed is when you go to the clinic, you see more and more women being diagnosed with diabetes. And in terms of men, statistics in South Africa says in 2016, but the numbers have increased now. In 2016, uh, it was found that three out of 10 men are either overweight or, or obese, um, which looks not too, that much, but uh, because the numbers are increasing yearly, men, it doesn't mean they are not, uh, they are, they are not at risk, but uh, women, we need to be more careful. So why are we getting obese? Or why are we developing all these non-communicable diseases? And I'm only going to focus on dietary causes. Remember, there are so many causes, but because uh, today's webinar is about diet, I will only focus on diet. So if you look at my breakfast, which will be the top row, um, there's Complex, it's cocoa pops, there is a raisin bread. And I'm, I'm mentioning those ones because as, as soon as I put up this light, they, those are the ones that quickly spoke to me because the colors are attractive, because they are greatly advertised. So they are out there in your face. And this is, unfortunately, this is what industry does. When you watch TV, you see uh, Rice Krispies flowing from the, from the bro, uh, box into, into the tub. And imagine what that does to children. Children want to eat complete because it is greatly advertised, because it is what is out there. And unfortunately, like people say, what we are feeding our children is sugar in a bowl. Because if you take, for example, complete and you look at it, um, it says the, it's made from corn. And then you ask yourself, how much corn is there in this conflict? So unfortunately, because of westernization, because of civilization, what do we put on our table is um, food items that has gone through so much processing that at the end, we end up eating food look like and not food anymore. If you look at my bowl, it looks innocent, it's quiet, nobody advertises it, but there's actually where nutrients are packed. There is no sugar, there's no salt, um, but unfortunately, because nobody talks about it, uh, it's left in the corner and we are leaving out the more nutritious food to the ones which are advertised as tasty, because a lot of sugar is added, a lot of additives is added, and also because it is very quick to make. Um, in the morning, everybody's rushed. We don't have time to make a soft porridge. And what is the quick thing to do? We pull out a box, we eat, and at the end, we have not really nourished our bodies. And in terms of snacks, uh, I'm looking at the, at the, ground, at the nuts there. Um, now it's winter. We have lots of those in Limpo. And the question is, how many of us are we still eating those nuts? Um, when we visit next door, before we leave, we're given a plastic bag full of nuts. Uh, but unfortunately, it's something that we produce in Limpopo, but we produce, produce it for selling, not really for a household consumption. And what we are doing is we are depriving ourselves of those nutritious food, which play the role of preventing diseases. If you look at things like milk and nuts, nobody advertises them. If you look at yogurt, which is supposed to be made, which is made from milk, but if you really think about it, how much milk is there in, in uh, how, many, how much calcium is there in, in, in yogurt compared to what one would find in milk? And if you really think about it in terms of cost, Yogurt and milk, you'll find that yogurt is even more expensive than milk. But right now, if we go to our fridges, 
we find that we have stacked on yogurt instead of milk. And what are we giving our kids? We are giving them sugar, we are giving them fat, we are giving them additives, we are giving them color. Uh, because it's being advertised. And those are, that is the reason why now we keep on talking about the rates of diabetes going high and high. So if you look at the ground nuts, for example, I'll talk about them because this is something that is free in Limpopo and it's readily available all winter. We, we have something that is called phytochemicals and even in milk, and this, sorry, not in milk, um, uh, in fruits. This is the chemicals that we, can, that we get from plant food. And what these chemicals do when they get into our bodies is they fight against disease uh, causing uh, agents. For example, nuts um, have been found that they're preventive against cancer. Moroho, preventive against diabetes. Things that we can freely get but because nobody's talking about them, uh, people are shunning them away and they're not eating them. Um, now let's go to school. Uh, look at uh, the far left, there's a bottle of water. How many of our children are drinking water? Or oh, even us, how many cups of water do we drink per day? We, 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 we have bought into the idea that when our kids go to school, we go to the supermarket, we buy boxed juice because it's in fashion, because it is easy to carry, because we have um, acclimatized our kids to drinking juice instead of water. And what are we putting into that time? It's, it's sugar, again, it's flavorings. Um, and one other thing that we do, if we go to, like, like when we're buying groceries, I have noticed that we buy this, bag that has 30 packs of um, Simba or it was there. Some, I don't even know their names. When our children start going to school, they carry these small school bags and let's just reflect we put in the school bags. It's either lollipop, sometimes we even go to an extent of buying a box of lollipops and then we put them in the, in the bag. And now we're talking about that's going high. And even ourselves, when we are thirsty and we want to quench uh, the thirst, how many of us reach out for a glass of water? It's Coke, it's fruit juice, which we think is 100, because it's written 100%, we think it is healthy. Let me tell you, it is not, it is full of sugar. So those are some of the things which increase the prevalence of uh, NCDs. And the worst one is money. Um, so many of our kids don't want to take uh, scarfing to school. They want to take money. And the question is, what are they buying? Because schools do not sell bread and peanut butter. Um, schools do not sell soft porridge. They buy pie, they buy fat cook, they buy chips. Um, so those are the eating, our, our current eating habits. Even ourselves, when we go to work, how many of us still take um, leftovers from yesterday? We take cash and what we buy with cash, food for thought. And then we come back home. Um, now, what are we eating for supper? Um, my favorite is the one in the middle because um, all that I do is to buy a bag of mealy meal and that's my moroho, which I pick, which I pick at the back. And look at the one, look at my place on the left-hand side. Colors have changed. We add color, we fry chicken, we fry beans, and, and that is where non-communicable diseases come in. Um, and the other dietary cause of obesity is the shopping malls that are mushrooming. Um, there is that shopping mall, which is now at my village. So whenever we want pizza, we quickly go there, which means now uh, we have access to all sorts of, um, all this pro uh, processed food, fatty food, salty food, and so forth. And shesanyama, we have bought into the notion that for one to eat, one has to eat a lot of meat, which is not true. It's a myth. We don't have to eat meat every day. And when, when we, people are complaining about food, they say, but we don't have money to, to buy meat. Let me tell you, 
um, we do not have to eat meat every day. There's so many things that we can eat uh, where we'll get all the nutrients that we will need. So in summary, I just wanted to say, um, we have moved from traditionally uh, traditional food and we are eating a lot of packed food because they're easy to prepare. They, we, they can keep long, they can be eaten anytime, anywhere, and uh, it's said they are tasty. Um, high in, but, but unfortunately they're high in total fat, high in saturated fat, high in sugar, high in salt, no vitamins, zero phytochemicals. And food preparation is also very important. This food preparation, we always forget to talk about it when we, we educate, but it is also very, very, very important. So here I just want to share uh, there's a study that was conducted in Elisras to check what people eat. The ages were between 18 and 30. And the first three items, if you look there, was fried chicken with skin, because we have now bought into the notion that uh, if you want nice food, you fry. Uh, and the third one, look at it, is cold drink. Think of the expense, think of the money that one could be using instead of buying cold drink, one could be buying a bag of orange or a head of cabbage and so forth. And this study was conducted in Soweto. They wanted to check um, what children eat when they go to school and tops, it was fried chips, fat cook and pie, um, followed by soft drinks, etc. The 11, the 11 males and 11 females it means um, the children were saying in a week, they will eat fast food maybe 11 times. And look at the snacks. In, in a seven day period, they will eat potato crisps, crisps uh, seven times in a week. And a week has um, seven days. So which means it's something that they eat on a daily basis. It is not just a treat. Um, so what are the consequences of obesity? Um, this one, we have all heard about it. It's the diabetes, high blood pressure, heart diseases, uh, respiratory disease, and cancers. But unfortunately, um, the diabetes is not only caused by being obese. You can, you can be of normal weight, but if you eat too much processed food, like food which is high in sugar, high in fat, you will still get diabetes, just like high blood pressure. One doesn't have to be obese in order to, to, to get high blood pressure. High salt intake can cause um, high, blood, high blood pressure. So in terms of numbers, uh, a study was done in 2016 and it was found that out of 10 people, four people had hypertension. And this was four years back, which means the numbers have increased. And we this is something that we really need to be doing something about it. And children, I have talk, talked about them. I just wanted to share that a study which was also done in 2016 found that out of 10 children, only five children had normal weight. The rest had a problem. Look at the number of children who were overweight, which was about 13%, which is a lot, because uh, research has shown that children who grow up being overweight will also grow up to be um, overweight adults. Um, so the questions we don't have to answer them now is, um, remember early childhood, children need nutritious food for the growing uh, brains. So the messages that we need to share with the community out there is, what are our children actually eating? And even ourselves, what do we pack in their lunch boxes? What type of food is sold at the tech shops? Uh, the sweets and the biscuits, do we give them every day or are they an occasional treat? And a big question for all of us, how easy is it to make healthy food choices in South Africa? Uh, so this is the last part, one of slides. Uh, then I'm asking us, which interventions do we need to reduce NCDs and obesity? Is it a question of willpower? Um, if, if, um, if there's a choice to be made between an apple and a donut, how is it, is it for a person to make a choice? Um, uh, I just want to summarize this slide by using the COVID-19 era as, as an example. 
um, we, 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 we have been taught about making choices as individuals and we are not being very successful, which means individual decision is very, very difficult. Communities, um, people have been teaching. We go to churches, they teach us about nutrition. We go to school, they teach us about nutrition. But still, we are finding this to be problematic. But when the government intervened, when the government made a pronunciation that fast food is not to be sold, um, food outlets are not supposed to sell um, a cooked food, we saw that fast food completely came to a halt. And that intervention was effective because it's something that was government driven, which uh, has now given me an idea. And this has been proven even in other countries. The next speaker will speak about it, that when government comes in uh, and brings intervention, then we see more changes and even better changes and more effective changes than if in, uh, decisions are left for individuals. So in summary or in conclusion, diet plays an important role in maintaining our health status. Um, the prevalence of NCDs and obesity greatly influenced the, it's influenced by the food that we select. South Africans are relying more and more on, high, on food high in salt, sugar, and saturated fats, and we're not eating a lot of fruit and vegetables. The incidences of NCDs are increasing and agent effective interventions are very necessary, especially at this point, to reduce the burden of NCDs and obesity. And I thank you. Thank you so much um, for a wonderful presentation, Makoma. Um, I will allow for the questions. There are questions that I'm picking up from the YouTube channel and question can also come on the chat tab uh, from the participants as some have joined through the YouTube and others have joined through the, um, um, they've joined the webinar through Zoom. So I'll quickly take a few questions. Um, we need to move because of the time. Um, the questions that I see relate to the next speaker, I will ask us to, to pack them and the comments. I've seen a comment talking about, let me start with the question from um, Kalimela from Positive Women Network. What is the good food that we have to eat? It's li linked to it. If I have NCD, that's the first question. The link to that, is say, it says, what is the amount of salt that body needs? Um, so those are the two questions. I don't know if you want to quickly respond to that. Um, so with the regards to diet, when someone has an NCD and the amount of salt. Thank you very much. Um, so when it comes to NCDs, there's a couple of things that we, we need to, 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 look, to consider. So the first thing that I always say to people is look at the portion sizes. That's the first thing. Um, and, and one of the quick advice that I give is look at the size of your plate. If your plate is, is, is that big one, reduce it because uh, a bigger plate will accommodate too much food, but as you reduce the size, then it forces you to eat a little. And another quick advice is on your plate, make sure you include a lot of vegetable. Actually, the quick advice is make sure that half of your plate is filled with vegetable. And the type of vegetable that you, 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 you eat, you also need to look at the type and how you prepare it. Um, make sure it's not, it's not chakalaka. Make sure it's not food that is prepared in a lot of salt, in a lot of um, sugar. Um, make sure it's food that is boiled or steamed or baked. And then for the remaining plate, half make it starch and half make it your protein. So your protein can be anything. It can be, it can be beans, it can be eggs, it can be chicken, uh, which is not fried most of the time. It can be meat, which you have removed fed, but, but uh, make sure that you don't, um, you, don't, you don't eat chicken that is 
I mean, meat that is prepared in a lot of fat, a, a lot of sugar, but may have few plates, uh, vegetables, quarter, starch, and the other quarter, big it uh, protein. And, and also include a lot of fruit and vegetables, if you can. Um, two to three fruit a day will be okay, but if you can't, one or two fruit a day. And in, term, in, in terms of salt, the recommendation is that in a day, don't exceed a teaspoon of salt. So a teaspoon of salt will be in all the food items that you, that you eat, don't put in too much salt. And the quick advice that we give is don't, don't put salt at your table when you eat. Whatever salt has been added to food, um, that's, that's it. So, so, so the advice is your uh, teaspoon, don't exit in, in a day. But again, it depends on your condition. Like if you're hypertensive, it will also depend on your level of blood pressure. And that is where now you need to consult with your health practitioner so that they can see how high the blood pressure is. Thank you. I hope I have answered the question. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Makoma. There are a couple of comments that I just want to read quickly. I think some, most of them are going to be covered by the next speaker. Um, uh, there's comment from Dr. Vicky, control respiratory illness like asthma and TB are not at increased risk of death. Obesity is a leading independent risk factor for death following COVID-19 infection. There are comments from Peter Joubert, um, but asthma and TB lowers your immune system, then will it not increase your risk of contracting other diseases? And furthermore, consequently contracting more severe symptoms and consequence of disease that those individual contract And another comment says, what is the best way to keep healthy diet when you are from poverty stricken family? I think it's related to the, to the other comment. There's also comment, a very interesting comment I have picked up from, from Sanele. He says, thanks. Thank you for this. Is there any regulation pronouncement that government can be held accountable for in terms of excessive sugar on our food on shelves? So I think some of this will be covered on the next presentation. Um, Ms. Makoma, if you agree with me and you can just know them down. I will also take any other further more comments. And when we go to um, towards the end of the session, we will uh, attempt to tackle those questions. I am just a bit concerned with time now to, to tackle all questions at this point in time. So if you allow me, I want us to move to, this, to the last speaker of the day. Okay. So you can unmute Ms. Makoma um, and remove the camera, which is um, our last speaker is um, Dr. Yandisa, whom I am still learning to pronounce the surname, um, who is basically a food and, 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 and policy researcher. Um, she's now based in Australia. Um, she is going to talk more around a lot of work. She's, a, she's, a, she's, she's actually a PhD, uh, she's a graduate. So that's why we're calling her a doctor. She's gonna talk us to us more about, um, <laughs> more about the food policy. There have been questions about what can government do to protect us, to protect our health um, in terms of access to healthy food. Um, so she's going to talk a lot about food regulation and policy uh, to protect um, our health and ensuring that the food system do cater for uh, access to healthy food for, for people who live in South Africa. So I'll hand over to you, um, Dr. Yandisa, to take us through your presentation. Please look out for time. 
uh, when you're presenting. Um, we already, so it's gonna be 20 minutes max. Okay, um, my slides are already being moved by someone else. Let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today and um, staying on to also listen to me. As my colleagues have uh, just said, uh, that government has a role to play in improving diets and uh, preventing non-communicable diseases. So in this presentation, I will talk about these policies. I will start with an introduction of food policies in general. And then I will look at some countries that have done well with food policies and then bring it home to South Africa to what our government is doing. And then I will conclude with what, with the role of civil society, uh, with what we can do as civil society to improve, uh, to, to improve or to contribute towards uh, making food policies. Um, so diets are a modifiable risk factor for non-communicable diseases, as my colleagues have said. And to explain the different policy actions that, that can be taken to improve diets, I am using the nourishing framework. Nourish the nourishing framework categorizes uh, food policy actions into three. So they talk about po uh, policy actions that are for the food environment, which is the N-O-U-R-I-S, um, in blue in the picture. And then the food system interventions, which is the green in the picture, and uh, the behavior change or communication policy interventions, with, which are the ING in the picture. So my focus today is more the food environment policy, but then all of these aspects are important. So I will briefly go through each and every one of them and just to make examples, but then at a later stage, I will just focus on food environment policy. So starting with the N of the nourishing, the N of the nourishing is about policies that set nutrition labeling standards. Think about the last time you bought a packet of food or food that is in a packet. Did you think about, did you think, did you check the label? Did you understand it? And have you bought a food item because it's written low in fat or that it's good for your bones? How true are these claims? So the basic, basically pol policies for labeling standards are to help us answer these questions. We want to be informed about these questions that I have asked and to not be misled and to be able to make healthier choices. And the next letter of the nourishing is O. And the O of the nourishing is about policies for offering healthy food and setting standards for public institutions. For example, a school food policy that says schools must provide um, healthy food during lunch for kids or Policies that say that tell that say in hospitals, for example, you cannot sell junk foods. I don't know how it is now, but I remember when I worked in hospitals in South Africa, there would be unhealthy food at the canteen. You would have a fed cook for lunch. There would be other unhealthy food in the vending machines or even at the streets as you live there. And that is the hospital that is dealing with um, health. So one of the recommended policy actions is to have policies to say, okay, in schools and in at workplaces, let's try to have healthier food, okay? And then the U of the nourishing is about policies that use economic tools to address affordability of food, as well as uh, giving people incentives to buy healthy food. An example of this is having taxes on unhealthy food, such as uh, sugary drinks, and also, subsidizing um, subsidizing healthy food. So for example, in South Africa, we have uh, some foods are vet free and that should push you towards buying those foods. But in some other countries, they have actual active subsidies um, where the government maybe pays a portion of for eggs and fruit and that makes the food cheaper. So this is an example of using economic tools to make food available. 
And then the next letter is R. And R, the R of the nourishing is about policies that restrict advertising, so food advertising. One of the biggest things that influences our diets is the foods that we see on TV, on billboards, when you watch a soapy, or on food, or when you go into the supermarket, there is so much advertising that it influences the choices of food that we make. So, um, for example, children are especially vulnerable to advertising because they cannot, they are not developed enough to say this is an advert and this is real. And the food industry is full of tricks. So even if they, they are not overtly advertising to say, okay, this is an advert, but they will put a cartoon on a box of cereal. And as a parent, you are working with your child and they will be attracted to that one because it's playful, it's colorful. So there's a lot of ways that the food industry tries to advertise to us or to promote their products. And some of them we are not even aware of. And then the, the second eye of the nourishing is about policies that improve the nutritional quality of the whole food supply system. So this means we don't put the burden of changing diets just on individuals, but we make changes at a higher level. For example, if the government knows that there's high, people eat a lot of salt and the salt comes from bread, it is more effective to speak to the companies that make the bread to reduce the to reduce the salt. So make a law or make a law for the companies to reduce the salt. This way, all the bread that is produced has less salt. And this has a bigger impact than going to door to door, like trying to tell people to eat less salt. So this has an effect on everyone, not just the people that have knowledge about the dangers of salt or people that that get reached by interventions anyway. Some people don't get access by intervention. So changes, making big changes in the system helps everyone. And then the S of the, the, S of the nourishing is about uh, policies that set incentives to create healthy retail and services and food services environment. Here, yeah, think about how many fast food stores are there in, in our neighborhoods. And now even the, the rural small towns are getting KFC, are getting uh, steers, are getting uh, other fried chicken that are not even necessarily KFC. So, um, and these are more than shops for healthy food. And currently when you go to a grocery store or a supermarket, when you check out at the till after you pay, you are more likely to see sweets and chocolates there, not fruits. So the food market or the food, the supermarket or the food environment is built in such a way that it forces, it makes you almost to choose unhealthy or it makes choose eating unhealthy very, very easy. And then moving on to the age, um, this is the sec this is the uh, the food system interventions now, no, not the food environment. So the age of the nourishing is about policies that harness the supply supply chain across all systems to address health. So this means this means what is called health in all policies. For example, before a fast food company come comes and opens shop in a small town with a promise of jobs, we have to think about the impact of this investment of health. So how many fast foods do we already have? How far are the fast foods from schools? And um, how does this affect the local food supply? So for example, if you bring in three KFCs or three, any other shops, sorry, I always make examples about KFC because I like it. But um, so how many fast food chains are already there? And how does this affect the local food supply? So if you bring all these big chains that grow potatoes in America and the salad there, what is it doing for the local food supply for small businesses? So this means that different ministries in government must talk to each other. So health must talk to economic development, who must also talk to agriculture. So this is how this, and now this is like much bigger it's bigger than us as health people, but it's it's like a, at a policy level and at a, and at a food system level. And then moving on to behavior change communication, and this this the last three letters. These policies happen at individual level. So I, the second I of the nourishing framework is about policies that inform people about food and nutrition. 
for example, most countries have a food-based um, guidelines, and I think there's one in South Africa. So we should have policies that say every year or every five years, there is a there's, there's a, a there's a guideline on how people in South Africa should eat. And this should be relevant and adaptable for all people in South Africa or for the different provinces and languages. And um, the next one um, is the N, and N is about nutrition advice. And this speaks to primary health care. So at primary health care level, there should be nutrition, the nutrition advice available and all other clinical interventions that are available for people that are already at risk. And lastly, the last letter is G. And this is about policies for giving nutrition, education, and skills. And this is about empowering people to make decisions uh, on their own. So where the health professionals are no longer involved, it's all that they're just like, it's building up the skills. So for example, having uh, food production in schools, having cooking skills in schools, having health literacy, so long-standing skills, people that skills that people can use their entire lifetime. And uh, so for people's behaviors to change, they have to know that um, healthy diets are good for them. On top of knowledge, they need skills. And on top of skills, they need access to healthy food. And then this will finally lead to behavior change. And if you are missing any of these, uh, we will do all these interventions, but then we need like one holistic um, approach to this. As I said, in this presentation, I will mostly focus on food environment policies, which is the blue part of the, which, which is the blue part of the picture. And I will focus on four key areas, which is the nutrition labeling, the use of economic tools, restrictions of marketing, and improving um, the quality of food in the whole supp food supply system. So I want to talk a bit about food, about the food environment. So what is the food environment? So the food environment is the foods that are available. So the foods, what, what kind of foods are available when you go to the shops, if you are hungry today, what type of food is available to you? And then the nutritional quality of food. Is it healthy food? Is it high in salt? Is it high in sugar? Is it fast food? Is it cooked at home? And how is this food labeled? So when you pick up this food, can it immediately tell you if it's healthy or not? And how much does this cost? So is healthy food more expensive than unhealthy food? And how is it advertised to you? Do you have misleading adverts that tell you that a box of uh, cornflakes has high fiber and it will give you energy? So this is what the food environment is about. It's just all is about what, what types of food are we exposed to? So the food environment in the picture that is on your screen now is the red part. And then, Good thing about the food environment is that it is sitting between the consumer, which is the individual diet in the blue and outside the, the, the food supply system on the arrows. So meaning that if you make changes in the food environment, you get changes in two directions. You can get changes in the food supply system and changes in the individual diets. How, let me make an example. So let's say uh, the government introduces a, a sugar tax. So what happens is Coca-Cola says, oh, there's a sugar tax now. I don't want my product to be taxed or I, I don't want to lose money from the taxes. So what I will do is that I will reformulate my, I will reformulate my, my, my product to, so that such that there's less, there's zero sugar and then this doesn't get taxed. And then what Coca-Cola does, they change the sugar and release more drinks that have less sugar. And then people also, because the prices of uh, sugar drinks increases, then people will be will move towards getting uh, the less uh, the less the less expensive, untaxed, and probably healthier beverages. So the long-term impact of this is better health health outcomes. So. Food environment policies are not only equitable, but they can lead to more sustainable changes. And then I'll um, go into the specifics of the nutrition labeling. 
So when you talk of nutrition labeling, we mean any graphic or written design uh, that is about the nutritional qualities of a product. And this can be at the back of the pack or a list of ingredients, just how the how the food, um, I have some examples on the screen. So you can have different types of labels. So the current challenge with these labels is that they don't tell, they don't immediately tell you if the food is good or bad. And most people are not even aware what the table at the back is for or any other labeling, for example. People just take check the expiry date and go. To improve this situation, some countries have been implementing front of pack front of pack labels. This can be traffic light signs where green is good, orange is moderate, and red is bad for salt or for fat. Other countries are using stars. If a food is bad, it has one star, and if it's good, it has five stars. And some are using warning labels. And warning labels just are just signs that tell you warning. Well, they don't really say warning, but they can say this is high in fat, high in sugar. And the idea behind these labels is that they should make choosing health, uh, making a healthy choice better without requiring the person to read and understand that a carbohydrate is, what, that this is a carbohydrate, this is a vitamin. So it should just be at first glance that, oh, this is healthy, this is not healthy. And um, so going back to some examples, uh, there's a country in Chile um, that has a country called Chile where they've made, uh, they've, they've implemented warning labels. So these labels are black, meaning that uh, they black and they just say high in, high in sugar or high in fat or high in all three or high in just one. So you can have one, one sign or many signs. And the color is black. So meaning that the label stands out against any color of a package. And this works well because in some countries where the food industry has been has managed to design their own products, they've managed to say, okay, we can choose any color that we want. Meaning that sometimes if the product has a red packet, they can also just make a red sign. So, and then it will be hardly visible. So, and also the use of warning labels eliminates the chances of people misinterpreting the label because the warning messages are only on, un on unhealthy food. So the minute you see that black sign, you know that, okay, this is not good for me. So then you don't have to interpret like when you see five stars or, or, or you see 3.5 stars, you're like, okay, three, three is good, three is in the middle so I can still eat it and five is bad. You just see a warning sign and then you can make that decision at that point without having to go through that decision-making process. So what these labels have done in Chile is that they've changed people's behaviors. And this is from academic research that shows that people uh, are now buying less food with these warnings. And also people, and also another important thing is that the changes in behavior were found both in high, in high educated um, households and low education households, meaning that these labels are effective across all sectors of society. So because they don't need anyone to read, so then the level of education is not a factor. And I think this is very important for countries like South Africa, where, the where, there is very, where there's very high inequality. Some countries like Mexico and Hungary also tax, uh, oh, sorry. And then now going over the use of economic tools, as I've mentioned before, um, I'm being told to wrap up because I don't have time. Uh, but uh, if I can, can I have five more minutes? Okay, please give me five more minutes. It's the last part, the important part is really at the end, but yes. I need to get up to get to that part. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, sorry, Doc, before you continue, I just wanted to check um, if the, the, the delegates can allow us to move a little bit the next 15, 20 minutes or so, um, so that we can allow time to the, for the questions. Your five minutes will take us to 12 o'clock. That was the time allocated for Zoom, for, for, for this Zoom and, and YouTube time. So I wanted to just check with the participants if, if that's okay. Uh, the people who want to still remain on the on the call um, to remain, so you can you can you can indeed quickly wrap up um, so that we can have enough time to 
there are a lot of questions uh, that, and comments that needs to be addressed as well and the way forward. Okay, um, so, and then um, going over, where was I? Okay. So now, um, so like, again, many countries have implemented um, sugar taxes. Um, so the most common of this is sugar taxes, like more than 28 countries have a, at least a sugar tax. And some countries like Mexico and Hungary also even have, um, like they also tax uh, junk food. And it may be argued that these taxes are regressive, so they affect, um, so they, they will affect the poor. But it's been shown that actually non-communicable diseases affect poorer people more than they do, uh, they, than not, that not more than they do well-off people. And in addition, revenues that are made from these taxes can be reinvested in health. And again, research on taxes has shown that this, this, um, these taxes are effective in changing behaviors and reducing the intake of sugar. However, there's no significant impact on weight. And um, so this shows that there's also a need for complementary strategies. So you can't just put, put on a tax and not, make, and not do anything else. And then I will then talk about um, food about uh, food advertising. Like I said, food advertising is one of the determinants of how 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 healthy people eat because people see adverts and they eat whatever they they eat what they see on on on. On, on TV. And in the past 10 years, there's been an increasing number of countries that are implementing food advertising policies. And these are mainly to protect children. And again, um, Chile has, has banned advertising to children under the age of 14 and, um, and doesn't allow the use of cartoon characters or children's voiceover so that children are not tricked into, um, are not tricked by uh, the advertisements. And again, these have been found to work, but they work partially because there's so many ways that advertisers work or there's so many ways of going around. For example, you can say don't advertise on TV, but uh, the food industry has a different ways. So for example, uh, going back to what my colleagues said earlier about the Gogos in Limpopo. So they are working hard, they're exercising, they have a soccer team. But then, um, and they're probably also trying to eat healthy. But then Coca-Cola is going to come and say, "Oh, listen, we want to sponsor your, we want to sponsor your your team to go to Brazil," and that's what they do. So they finance the team, and for them, so they are advertising them even with our own uh, public health initiatives. And this has been seen also with school sports where Milo is going to sponsor a, sponsor a soccer team. And then immediately in a parent's mind, even though Milo is so high in sugar, it's healthy. It gives my child energy because they sponsor uh, sports events. And uh, just to go to uh, the last policy is uh, reducing uh, improving the nutritional quality of food. And this is when you tell the industry to reformulate. So change the amount of salt, or even just by introducing a tax, people like companies will run away from the tax and try to change their, or to change their products anyway. And um, just to wrap up, I want to like, just briefly highlight what South Africa is, um, what South Africa is doing. So when it comes to nutrient labeling, uh, South Africa is in the process of developing warning labels that are similar to the ones I described from Chile. And um, so these are to empower South Africans to make better choices. And um, according to what I know, these labels will be mandatory, meaning that the meaning that uh, they will be mandatory for all packaged foods or whichever foods they haven't decided what they will apply to. Because the policy is in the stages of development, this is, time, this is the time where the industry also fights back to have labels that will be less strict or that will make it easier for them to, buy, to bypass the law. So it is very important now for civil society and for everyone else to start paying attention to 
what 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 the design of the label in terms of color the size where will it be put and what nutrient criteria will be used to determine what 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 foods will get the labels and which ones will not be getting the label and then when it comes to use of economic tools we know that south africa introduced a sugar tax and um we don't uh, when it comes to incentives we don't have any uh our basic foods are not are vet free, but we do not have any active subsidies for health now. And I think for South Africa, this is very, very important. Uh, this is very, very important to make sure that our tax actually pushes people towards healthier food and health, healthy food that they can access. So the, the current tax hasn't been long enough to be, for us to be able to measure the impacts of behavior, but we know that it did. it is earmarked for revenue for health promotion so which is good and that um based on research in other countries we expect it to have an impact and then again um when it comes to salt south africa was the when it comes to improving the nutritional quality of food south africa was the first country to introduce a legislation that says uh listen do not you cannot have more than this amount of salt in your food and um this this was done for food that contribute the most to food to salt intake in south africa like bread cereals and um and early evaluations of this policy show that even in the beginning some companies were already starting to change their behavior so meaning sometimes the government just has to say something and the industry will start moving and then when it comes to food marketing restrictions um unfortunately uh there is no government policy to regulate advertising in 2014 the national department of health tr tried to introduce our uh, restrictions on food marketing however this did not happen because communication meaning what you see on tv or on the phone social media advertising they don't fall under department of health but under department of communications and this highlights the point that i made earlier that the government departments actually um, need to work together. So currently we have what is called self-regulation, meaning the, the food companies make their own rules. Okay, um, as McDonald's, I will not advertise to children. And then at the end of the year, McDonald's marks their own exam to say, okay, I passed, I didn't advertise to children. And so then there's no monitoring, nobody knows if they are really, really doing what they're supposed to do. And nothing is ever done unless there's a complaint. So if there's no complaint, the ad stays and if there is a complaint the only thing that happens there's no real punishment the only thing that happens is that okay mcdonald's remove that advert so and i would like to conclude by just um by just like in the interest of time by just highlighting the role of society so of civil society so I would like us to think of policies as ideas um that are in a race and the finish line being the finish line is the actual policy, but everything, they all start as ideas. And there are many ideas and not all the ideas uh, will cross the finish line and become policies. So meaning that intention to introduce policies are announced all the time, but not all the policies are signed off to be implemented because there's a lot of hurdles uh, and a lot of back and forth opposition between announcements. So you can have uh, you can have things like opposition from the food industry saying, OK, uh, minister, you don't have a right to do that. I'll take you to court or you can get opposition from other government ministries uh, like we saw with tobacco, where, um, the agriculture and health were in a bit of a fight there or you can get COVID-19 so we can now think that in a, in a year's time we'll get front of pack labels but there can be a new minister and a lot of thing happens from the idea up until the policy and this is what makes uh like the role of civil society very important so we need uh to rally community support for policies because policy I ideas become policies when they are supported by communities to go across the finish line and we also need to form coalitions with other groups that have common interests we know that the expertise and the role of civil society differs uh but then if the groups come together they can capitalize on different skills and different um, access to resources. And also the industry does a lot of things to oppose policies. And one example is producing evidence that the police will not work or that the problem is not that bad. 
and so they can they do a lot in in countering evidence and uh to say that no the problem is not the diet it's because people are not physically active so they do a lot of those things so our civil society has a role in supporting existing credible evidence and also when resources allow also generating evidence on their own so for example now with the new labeling that's going to come the food industry can come and say oh this label is not going to work for rural communities and if civil society has been working with rural communities to show that or oh, they actually understand this label and this is the type of label they they, they prefer, even if the food industry comes to fight, there'll be evidence that shows that this will work and it has worked elsewhere. And lastly, sometimes food policies make it across the finish line, but they don't achieve the intended purpose because there are loopholes. So civil society has a role to play in scrutinizing the policies. So for example, you can start thinking that you will have a black warning label that stands out on a packet that is applicable to unhealthy food, but you can end up with a traffic light or a small logo that is not as strong or that is not as effective as a warning label. So we have an important role in, in scrutinizing the policies and just saying, okay, this is not going, going to work, or this is too easy, or this will this is a loophole. And because um, at the end of the day, we don't just want policies, we want uh, policies that have teeth and that can be effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Doc. Um, let me just, for, the, for such a powerful presentation and we, we will have missed the happy ending uh, the powerful side of how, where we are and what are some of the things that we still need to do as civil society to ensure that the policies um, that are in place, they can protect our health and NCDs. I will open up for the floor. There are a lot of comments on YouTube um, that, that are coming through, but a lot of them are comments and questions. Can we get the, the participant unmuted and hear the voices of people from Limpopo? First, the civil society organization and community reps for Limpopo um, and take questions um, for this presentation or any other questions that you may have on the three presentation. Um, I will give it up a few minutes. Um, thank you everyone for keeping on. Um, the time I know it's short and we have run a bit out of time, but thank you everyone for, for keeping in touch. We don't want to lose your voice and hear your comments and, 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 and questions at this point in time. So let me open for like a 10 minutes or so and get more questions and comments um, from the delegation from Limpopo first. And then I can also allow my colleagues uh, and comrades to actually also comment. So comrades, starting with the people in Limpopo, can we get your questions, comments, uh, reflection on the presentation? On the presentations, this one and the and, and the and the other two presentations that came before. I want to see if we have a hand from the attendees. Do we have a hand? My colleagues um, at Rep and Hila, please also do assist me if you do see. There is a hand from Lydia Mabena. Uh, Lydia, please unmute and shoot straight with your question. Lydia, can you unmute your mic? Yes. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you colleagues. Thank you for the nice presentation that was presented to us. It has really, it really opened our eyes because we are so ignorant about many things. We didn't know many of the policies that were there. So this just to say thank you. I hope we wanna Google and, and connect with our colleagues and get more information on this. Then we'll have a plan on what we are going to do as civil society towards our, our people so that we can stay healthy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Lydia. Mm -hmm. 
You can go ahead, Doc. I know I just wanted to say thank you. I'm glad um, it was clear. Is there any hand from our comrades and colleagues in Limpopo? I see a hand from Tabo and MJ. Uh, if you can as make it make it a snapshot, maybe let's start with MJ. Thank you, Comrade Law. Um, there was just one question from the first presentation that stuck out for me that I was curious to find out. And that was the question around the 40% of men um, that, are, that are more likely to die from COVID-19 as opposed to women that the research found. And I wanted to find out, Indoba, is there a specific reason why men we are finding men dying more from COVID-19 than women. Great. So we, we will we'll, we'll expect our panelists to respond to that. Um, let me take Tavo. Um, his hand is up. Um, then we'll, we'll, we'll get the response to all the questions that have come through. Okay. For, for I think for the civil society, um, side I, I i don't know is there anything maybe civil society can do when it comes to i see uh, um, uh, uh, the previous speaker has just uh, spoken about the um, advertising so i have a, a problem with um advertising so i just want uh, the background i know like a uh, civil society uh, uh, done a uh, very great work when it when it came when it comes to um the implementation of the, the sugar tax in South Africa. So is there anything that can be done when it comes to advertising? Why I'm saying this? Because I think the industry, um, they are very smart. Remember when uh, there was a lot of conversation around uh, advertising using cartoon, uh, the, the, the junk food using cartoon, cartoon characters because they are actually attracting the kids, especially the, the TV uh, TV advertisements, the TV ads. And now I haven't seen those like for, for quite some time on the TV, but they have a strategy because um, I stay with a 11 year old nephew, Anne, and uh, he's so interested in action movies. If you have seen the uh, chicken licking um, advertisements, they are so attractive. And especially to these boys, children who are young, who love action movies, they get attracted to those ads. At the end, you find that they advertise uh, chicken licking. And there's no way kids won't be interested in those kinds of food because this is a strategy of um, attracting a viewer and at the end, uh, while they are expecting something else, you give them your final product that actually this is what I'm advertising for you. So I don't know if civil society can also have a look on that. And the times when we see uh, those adverts, I've never seen that advert. Sometimes I stay up to 12, even one watching a TV, but uh, those adverts are around uh, seven or 12, eight or 12, when everybody, it's family time, we're watching news, we're watching the soapies, thanks. Thanks so much, Tavo. Uh, is there still any question or comment um, from the participants? Okay, um, let's get the panel to give feedback uh, or, or response to the to the question. Um, I'm not gonna come. Can I come in particular order? Do you wanna start, um, Dr. Yandisa? Who is ready, Dr. Koza or Miss Magom? Hi, Lawrence, I can go and I can answer the question that was asked with regards to um, why we're seeing more deaths um, of, from coronavirus in men. So, I mean, there are quite a few studies that are being done. There is no direct answer at the moment. And the um, things that are coming up from the studies at the moment is that one, there's behavioral um, differences between men and women. So it, men are, um, more likely to partake in risk factors such as smoking, such as um, not um, keeping to the social distancing rules. So that's one of them. The other ones are to do with genetics and to do with chromosomes. So some of the studies are saying that because women have um, two X chromosomes, they have stronger immune systems um, compared to men who just have one X chromosome and just um, have a 
have one X chromosome and a Y chromosome, but this is, there is no direct answer, unfortunately. Um, and the studies are, everybody is actually asking that question and um, people are just trying to figure it out with studies. They're looking at different things in the blood just to see why men are dying more. Um, but it does seem like there is some sort of behavioral reasons um, where men have put themselves more at risk because of the lifestyle um, that they live, but also there's um, genetic factors as well. Thank you. Dr. Andisa, you can hit straight. Thank you so much. Okay, um, what is the role of food society in advertising? I think now there's two, there's like, um, okay, in 2014, there was that policy that was out for public comments. And um, after that, it was actually found out that um, that uh, Department of Health has no authority to make laws for advertising. So I think uh, the one, well, the first thing is to pressurize uh, right submissions uh, to the Department of Communications because at some point someone will have to take a stand and make uh, and 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 do something about it. But then there's also like where you can report like the advertising standards. Uh, or regulator and so when you see an ad you can report there but so even though we don't have a regulation we, we have this voluntary they are weak and i say they don't have that 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 much teeth but then because there are structures that are already there civil society can start engaging and say okay you don't have to wait for mcdonald's to do something wrong and how can we expand these pledges to make them include more include more types of advertising. So maybe talk to the structures that already exist because changing a law takes a long time and attracts a lot of opposition. But now like the advertising standards regulator, for example, they can start by having a formal monitoring system that actually does spot checks on adverts that are done on TV or on social media. And then so that the industry is not marking their own exam, that some there's an outer body that's monitoring it. And this wouldn't require a new law, but it would require just strengthening what is already there. And that is where civil society can come in is to identify areas now in what we already have what can we do in what we have to try and change it while we're trying to see if the Department of Health and the Department of Communication will ever come together and have uh, strong policies for advertising. Great. Uh, my colleagues do assist me. Is Do you see any question that I have not picked up? Um, again, comrades, engage, use your mother tongue. Um, we are aiming to finish this by half past later, so we're not gonna exceed that. Um, if there are no further questions, um, I see a hand from Andronika. Um, please, Andronika, you can go ahead with your question or comment. Please don't forget to unmute your mic. Your mic is still on mute. Andronika, you are still on mute, so we can't hear you. Please try oh, to sorry. unmute your mic. Yeah, we can hear you now. Seems we have a problem. Can with you the... Yes, please go ahead. Okay, my question is for the previous presentation about the food preparation. I just want to know how good is how good is it to eat a raw vegetable like spinach and beetroot? Like the, there is a, this vision of eating a raw a raw vegetable. I just want to know how good is it? Is it good or is it wrong? Thank you. Any comment from our panel? Yes, uh, thank you, Lawrence. Can I respond? Yes. Okay, there is there is absolutely nothing wrong in eating um, raw fruit and vegetables. Remember, I talked about the phytochemicals, and also 
when you eat raw fruit and vegetables, you, you get a lot of vegetable, I mean, vitamins and minerals. Remember that when we cook food, we um, sometimes we lose the vitamins, especially if you cook food in a lot of water. But having said that, there's also absolutely nothing wrong in also cooking them because when you cook them, you sort of improve the taste. So what is important is do not add too much water and do not cook um, for, a, for a long time because then you lose out on some of the nutritional value. But if a person prefers to eat them raw, it is still fine. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone. And thank you to- Can I also, sorry, Lauren? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Can I also respond to the question that was uh, asked earlier regarding um, taking medication when people do not have access to food? Yes. This is a very difficult, yeah, it's a very difficult one. And I think that is the reason why the government is giving out food parcels and the 350 that is being given out because uh, to be honest, we need money in order to buy food. So the advice that I could give is we make the most of what people have. Um, if people have, uh, like if they can afford a bag of mealy meal, that is where we start. And a person asked about people in their farms. What I have realized is when people work in the farms, in most cases, the farm owner would give a small portion of the farm to let them plant, grow their own spinach and tomatoes and things. So one of the advice that we give is make your own small gardens. Even in, in our own backyards, I see people using old washing basin, they put soil inside and then they make their own uh, vegetables to go with the bag of mealy meal. So it, it requires us to like, uh, sort of think out of the box and not only look at money to access food. And we, we can also advise them to prioritize instead of buying, I don't know what, instead of buying Oros, instead of buying um, Coca-Cola, we advise them to take that money and buy um, Crate Yamai, the, the one that carries 60, something like that, or buy beans. So we look for food that is not too expensive, but that can stretch a little bit. So it, it requires us to like sort of things out of the box. So if they can only afford a bag of meal, meal and a bag of potatoes, maybe what you can advise them is instead of buying a 10 kg of potatoes, they can buy a 5 kg. And then with the remaining money, they buy two heads of cabbage. So something like that. Uh, because it is a very, very difficult one and the reality that we, we live with. Last night I was looking at the news, sorry to take long, and I, I've seen that the Department of Agriculture is giving out some sort of structure and seeds to assist people to grow their own vegetables, because that's, that's it looks like it's the way to go these days to increase uh, food security. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ras, um, closing remarks and just a way forward in terms of where do we go from here in terms of um, future plans? Please, very brief. Russell, I think you are on mute. Thank you very much for a very robust discussion today. I think there's no simple solutions to, to really addressing issues like NCDs or diet transition. I think the important thing that we have to remember is that under our Bill of Rights, we guarantee everybody right, access to a safe environment. We have a right to food and we have a right for, for, for just treatment. You know, in a country like ours, I think... There's no easy answer. You know, we can talk about obesity and 
70 percent of, 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 of our people are obese but we can't have these conversations by without looking at the complete array of it you know when we talk about school nutrition we still don't have a guideline as uh, on a school nutrition policy so that we can have standardized school meals even though we have a school feeding program so i think in a lot of ways we have to learn some of the lessons from our struggles before particularly our struggle around getting hiv treatment in the early 2000s when many of us many of the big analysts told us no it's too complicated people won't understand it and but I think the important thing is that we must try and avoid shifting responsibility to, in, in, to communities who don't always have the capacity, capability, or the information to make just choices. And I think our immediate struggle right now is to have a public conversation and dialogue amongst ourselves and amongst our communities to talk about the relationship between food and health and broader development. So I just like to, to say thank you for everybody. And, and I think over the next couple of weeks and months. We hope to engage into a number of more of different kinds of webinars that looks at drilling down some of these issues more specifically. This one was really just to introduce the issue of non-communicable diseases, to raise awareness amongst organizations working in health and in the general public, and to start thinking about how we can develop a community base, a community-centered advocacy strategy for a better response to non-communicable diseases and regulating the food environment so that we don't place ourselves at greater lifts. But thank you very, very much for your time and for the very interesting and robust discussions. Over. Okay. Russ, um, just to let everyone know, you, you can access um, the video, the full video recording and the slides on the YouTube link. Huh? It kills this um, <laughs> It does, it does. Please, please, please think, unmute us. I'm learning so much, but I think we yeah. personalize this food issue. We make it an individual yeah. responsibility yeah. to yeah. too much. Yeah. You know, we exercise more, you must eat less. Yeah. Okay, yeah, now Raz is muted. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to overhear that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was saying on the, on the YouTube link that we have shared, you will get the full video recording of the webinar as well as the presentations uh, from all the speakers. Uh, we will follow up also with the Limpopo Civil Society leaders, if in case people cannot achieve or archive that, to share actually the presentations. This is the beginning of the conversation. When the COVID-19 has cleared out, we're gonna descend down into communities and have these workshops and conversation and engagements and really build the arm of community response into NCDs. Um, so I want, I would love to thank our speakers, Dr. Yandisa, Dr. Koza, Ms. Bopape for a wonderful, wonderful, uh, and for taking your time in these hectic times of new normal to actually avail yourself to speak to the communities of Limpopo and across South Africa. And thanks to everyone who had joined through the Zoom and through the uh, YouTube channel. Um, follow us on Facebook, um, it's Healthy Living Alliance and Rural Health Advocacy Project. Follow us on Twitter, follow us on YouTube, follow us, uh, like us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter as well, and Instagram. Um, we would like to continue engaging with you further, and we're looking forward to build more work and workshops at the communities when situation um, becomes more clearer and uh, we can have an open face-to-face um, um, workshops. So I would like to thank everyone. I will um, declare the session, the webinar um, closed and as we have come to an end. Uh, and thank you everyone, every delegate who participated and making time. Amanda, Aluta continue.